Hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, panel, um, which is titled Memes Are New. Um, this is Gabriele De Seta from the University of Bergen. Um, and I'm joined today by Idil Gallup from University of Amsterdam, Lucy Chateau from Tilburg University, and Gunseli Yeltsinkaya from, well, Dazed. Uh, she's a freelance writer and a researcher. And um, today's panel um, is about um, what I think is one of the most paradigmatic objects of internet culture, that is memes, or what are one of the most paradigmatic objects of internet culture, but also um, it's about one of the most representative ideas uh, of return or cyclical novelty that I could think of. Um, so when we started talking about this event, uh, about how discourses of novelty and innovation and things that are always new uh, are very much uh, common in debate about internet culture. I, I I could, what I thought of is memes because I thought memes are discussed as if they're always new, but at the same time, there's something that's been arguably around forever. Um, and they're weirdly connected to ideas of novelty or oldness. Um, and um, the debates around them are interesting. And I, I think um, I really wanted to to have a discussion around these themes um, with a few people that I enjoyed writing off. So um, I have um, just a few slides for this uh, short introduction. I wanted to frame the debate uh, before we start. And um, oops, yes. So when I, I started studying memes uh, 10 years ago at this point, um, and back then, my interest was mostly about uh, memes that were shared in China on Chinese social media, because uh, that was my area of research. So I've kind of been into the field of uh, internet studies, meme studies for a decade. And at that time, uh, the books I was reading were uh, ranging from uh, more ethnographic explorations of creativity online. Uh, people were talking about stuff like digital folklore or more uh, media studies uh, approaches to you know, this spreadable media, Harry Jenkins approach. And uh, there were also scholars like Lamore Schiffman who started writing about memes, giving the term itself uh, sort of legitimacy in internet studies. So this is where I sort of joined in this emerging uh, area of studies, of uh, yeah, internet studies dealing with memes and other forms of uh, vernacular creativity. But I also looked at earlier texts, and I'm sure a lot of people who, who looked into the history of the term meme um, have come across books like Richard Dawkins' The, Self the Selfish Gene, where the, the word was actually used for the first time, arguably, or uh, Susan Blackmore's The Meme Machine. The whole trend of uh, what, what were called memetics, um, so this sort of uh, more scientific, psychological approach to the idea of ideas yeah, to the idea of ideas that are spread between and uh, transfer and infect brains and stuff like that. And, and it's interesting that uh, there's a whole history, of kind of a self-reflexive history, where, where users have commented on the fact that uh, Richard Dawkins invented the term, but then it turned out the internet meme is not exactly what he meant, um, and that this term has shifted. So I think what's interesting is that even if this word, the word meme, seems new, is discussed as something new, a neologism in media. Um, it actually is not, and it has established itself. Uh, it has changed its meaning. So now when we say meme, we actually mean internet meme. We mean actually maybe an even broader kind of uh, vernacular creativity of digital folklore that transcends the internet. There might be memes on specific platforms or uh, even non-digital media. So in, in this other sense, Yes, memes are new, but actually they've been around uh, for a long time and they've established uh, themselves as a, as a term. And um, what I mean by memes existed even before the internet, uh, I give an example. Uh, when, when the main medium of offices were photocopy machines, there were arguably the same kind of uh, funny and humorous images that were photocopied and stuck on cubicle walls by employees. And this has been recognized as a form of folklore already uh, in the 80s and 90s, and it was called Xerox lore. 
And before that, uh, one can think that you know every form of communi- uh, every medium communication medium had its own kind of uh, vernacular creativity. Even if we go back to I don't know cave paintings, uh, if we knew what the paintings meant, it's likely that some of them were were forms of humor that were shared by people. And so what what changed I think is uh, is the, the the genres and the medium through which we develop them, but the topics and the sort of um, uh, even humor strategies of humor and uh, the self-reflexive critiques that are embodied in memes have not changed much. If you think of memes today that I, I do not understand and, and people that are 14, 15 year old create through video game engines, uh, you can cre- clearly see a pattern that spans decades um, and maybe even centuries. So um, I, I found it interesting that one of the earliest uh, documented memes uh, is from World War II um, and is the Kilroy was here meme, this this little uh, scribbled face uh, peering over a wall that was drawn by uh, soldiers uh, to basically make fun of their lack of supply or uh, yeah share some moments uh, on the battlefront. And this meme was also called Mr. Chad in the UK. And I found it interesting that, again, you can see the resonance between um, these, you know, sort of uh, stylized representations and and stereotyped uh, formats of memes today that resonate with what was happening uh, almost a century ago at this point. So um, one one thing that struck that strikes me uh, about memes is that when we compare this sort of imagined novelty, there is also a, a real sense of um, ancient. Uh, knowledge that accumulates and endless novelty that needs to be interpreted. And this is very much connected to generations. So you can find archives of ancient memes, you know, uh, memes and posts from a forgotten era of the internet. And then you have a lot of discourse about interpreting uh, memes and and vernacular creativity from other generations. So there's millennials uh, who, who make fun of boomer humor, uh, that their parents or relatives share on on social media, but then there are uh, there is also the the weird feeling of millennials not understanding Gen Z's uh, absurdist humor apparently, and and then you know the same kind of uh, debates also talk about Gen Z worried about that they don't understand Gen Alpha's memes, and you can see this uh, ongoing cycle of novelty where generational changes are connected to uh, is actually you know, very much cyclical um, forms of creativity that don't really change that much, I think. So I I would like to kick off this panel um, with this quote by Lisa Gittelman from the book Always Already New, um, where she she's talking more broadly about about media, but I think this applies very much to to memes and creativity through digital media. Um, She says, the introduction of new media is never entirely revolutionary. New media are less points of epistemic rupture than they are socially embedded sites for the ongoing negotiation of meaning as such. Comparing and contrasting new media thus stand to offer a view of negotiability in itself, a view that is of the contested relations of force that determine the pathways by which new media may eventually become old hat. So I really like that she, in in this whole book, she discusses different kind of uh, media that at some point have been thought of as new, Um, but she recognizes that this this novelty is never entirely revolutionary or new, but what matters is how this media are socially embedded and how novelty is negotiated, meaning is negotiated by people through them. So I would repeat the title of this panel as a sort of question now. So are memes new? Uh, what does this mean and how how are they new? What kind of novelty this is? And I will perhaps uh, start by throwing this very broad question at all three panelists uh, that I invited today. So um, welcome and uh, good to see you. And maybe going in order of uh, how, how your names are written on screen, um, I'd just like to hear your broad response to, to my provocation that maybe we can move to more organic discussion. Idil, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, thanks for inviting me to this exciting um, panel. Um, Gabriel and I have been, I think, talking about memes online and offline for a while, so it's nice to just um, share some ideas. Um, 
I don't think, I mean, so I've like thought about this question about like, about whether or not memes are new in uh, in some and I think different ways. So the first um, thing that comes to mind is that memes are new or not new depending on the kind of definition that you that you pick up. So I think if we're to you know take this like broad view of memes as culture, then of course, or like replicable culture, of course, like we said, they're not new. It's just the way that culture is produced is through, I think, supposedly memetic meme means. Um, but if we're to think of what memes look like now in 2023, I think they're new because of the because of some of the platforms through which they travel. Um, <clears throat> I think also the the general discussion about whether memes are new or not. Um, you, I see um, newspaper articles or public discussions every year or every month, basically, about how memes are new. But not only are they new, they're also weird and and unique and and also they have this untapped potential, which I feel like usually that's kind of the gist of let's say like um, newspaper articles or just um, more publicly, uh, I think like public views of memes. And I think there is something to be said about maybe that. And I think what's really discussed in those public discussions is not whether or not culture is new or whether like the jokes that we make are new. I think we all know that they're not. It's just about the kind of the new functions of culture or like replicable culture. Um, or memes, um, the new these new functions that they have. I mean, one thing when, when that I was thinking about um, getting ready for this panel was the role that memes play on platforms. I think after kind of the let's say the colonization of all content under um, like three companies, we've gotten these platforms on which were uh, overloaded with different types of content. So I was thinking to um you know when i was coming up uh, we used to i used to go to different websites for different types of content and obviously now we have all of that as a result of this like kind of capitalistic expansion of the internet we have all that content that used to be in different websites all in one place so i'm thinking of instagram for instance where i go on there and i'm kind of provided with all sorts of content and I feel, um, of course, there's, you know, algorithms that categorize the sort of content that we look at. But I think memes also do some of that. I feel like memes have become these like almost like algorithmic runoff in which they uh, make someone aware of different kind of cultural touch points. And then they put it all together in one image in which you can, you know, you can be in touch with different um, discourses, but also different trends and different things that are, um, you know, in the public eye. So I think memes also do this like interesting function of um, organization of like uh, the wealth of content that we're, that we're provided with. And it also keeps people in the loop. So perhaps what they do are new, but what they are isn't. I think that's that's me. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Um, Lucy, do you want to? Yeah, totally. Yeah, thank you so much for that really good introduction. And yeah, you already brought up so many great points. Um, I think from my perspective, I'm like also really interested in like meme aesthetics and the formats that memes take. So like what you've already brought up about like uh, especially current war and like uh, the history of creativity and like folklore like not exactly being new I also want to stress that like the aesthetics that we're seeing in memes are also kind of like they've inherited a really long legacy and you said like they span like the history of memes might span decades or centuries I totally agree I think like the meme aesthetics that we're seeing are really like um uh, they're really indebted to uh the aesthetics that we've seen throughout history like going back to like the carnivalesque but also Dada and all of those kind of like subversive aesthetics that we've seen up until like new media and like glitch, like all those new media forms of uh, collage and so on. And so they kind of like stand in this very long tradition of like um, art history and also like social forms. So 
they're kind of a manifestation of like where we are at this point in time um, as a result of like art movements, but also like social movements and so on. So I would say like um, the last quote that you showed uh, was a perfect like encapsulation of like how um, I really see memes as the, the product of this dialectic between like the kind of like technological form of digital capitalism that we're experiencing, which we've already brought up to like platforms and like mobilizing creativity and so on. Um, and the kind of creative uh, like a uh, spirit that there is in society that we always see expressed through folklore and so on. So memes are kind of, I think, this like um, they stand in this long tradition, um, but that doesn't exactly mean that like, um, you know, they are nothing new. I also think they're like this great engine for creativity and novelty. And I think the kind of work that we see done in memes is so interesting, especially um, right now in the age of like um, AI, the rise of AI, when we think about AI produced images that are so you know, middling, like they're averaging out a data set or like their mean images, as Sterling would say, um, the memes are like doing the opposite of that work. You know, they're creating kind of like erratic, rhizomatic, esoteric aesthetics that are kind of like way more creative than um, anything that we can always get produced by AI. So to me, like uh, the fact that memes have this novelty is also like really important to uh, keep in mind just for like the kind of um, artistic health and social creative health of our society. Um, so that's my two introductory thoughts about memes, but I also have so many things I want to bring up from just what has already been said. Yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll get to that for sure. Um, Gonzalo, do you want to go next? Um, yes, first of all, thank you for that brilliant introduction and hello to the other panelists as well. Um, yeah, I guess uh, just to kind of go off what everyone else is saying, um, I, yeah, I feel like memes themselves obviously aren't new, but I think the kind of memes that we used to develop the memes are new, the memes um, are new. Um, I think it's very interesting to see how, like, again, yeah, I feel like at the moment memes are responding to kind of advancements in technology, um, whether that's AI or the kind of modes that people use to create those um, memes. So that could be video game engines like you touched on earlier. Um, I guess one of the things that I've really seen change in the last year or so is because of the changes to the algorithm and social media platforms, um, paired with the fact that there's no kind of political potential on the horizon at the moment, especially for young people. Um, perhaps if memes um, carried more of like a political thrust in kind of like the post-2016 era, which we saw kind of with places like Theorygram, um, we're now seeing kind of like this strange kind of high weirdness develop with memes, um, which is again, fueled by algorithmic content. Um, the memes that we create are kind of created for virality, created with the kind of algorithm in mind. Um, so I think it's interesting for me, I guess, to kind of observe um yeah how that kind of creates the the kind of content that we consume lovely thank you i i already jotted down some some interesting points from all your uh responses and i think it's it's a very good starting point to start differentiating from what's new to what's old or, or you know cyclical about them so aesthetics might be recurring but what they do is new, as uh, Idil said. Um, so they are something that recurs, but they do something new, or um, they they respond to new technologies, but actually they allow for um, on ongoing uh, forms of creativity that these technologies cannot yet um, achieve. So I think these are really interesting points. Um, I forgot to tell to ask you uh, if you wanted to uh, also say something about your own research. Um, or how you got to memes, or you know what, how your work intersects with these forms of creativity, just for for the audience. Um, but maybe we can do this uh, in another round uh, because I wanted to to know more, um, a bit more uh, about the contextual or situated differences between what we uh, call memes in English uh, right now. Uh, and the same kind of things that might be happening in in other places uh, that are not just in the past, but you know, different linguistic or cultural, national or regional contexts. Um, as I was saying in the introduction, I I sort of 
started looking into this topic um, when I was doing research about the use of uh, digital media in China, um, which was very, uh, very random uh, thing that happened in my academic uh, career. Uh, I was just doing research there and I started seeing people using the internet more. And then I started noticing things that looked like what I called memes, um, but they were not called like this in China. Um, and as a matter of fact, the whole um, lexicon of, let's say, creativity online or viral content was an almost entirely different from uh, what people use in English or in other languages. And, and I'm Italian. So for example, I, I can see how meme is used in, in Italian as a word, but it's pronounced differently. And it has sort of different, slightly different um, uh, range. So some things that are called meme in Italian, maybe are not really memes for an English speaker and so on. So, so I'm, I'm quite interested in your experiences, how you encounter them, you know, how long it has been and in which kind of, uh, of contexts you have observed these things. And if there's any difference there as it relates to novelty, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, feel free to just jump in um, whoever wants. I'll just um, start it off. I mean, this is interesting because I, uh, when I was, I think, so now I'm 30. And when I was online, um, <laughs> I think I went online when I was like 12. So when I was come, like growing up, I was um, consuming what we call, I guess, content in English and in Turkish. And I was, um, I was really into Turkish memes, of course, they weren't called memes. I think recently meme has become a term that is used, but mostly because of, I think, the kind of abundance of English memes for uh, younger people. So I think um, people younger than me, maybe Gen Z or Gen Alpha, uh, they've kind of taken on the term uh, meme because of all the shit posting accounts, I think, on Instagram or all these like Finstas, etc. But when I was growing up, it was, there were different names for it. So one of the names um, that was kind of used for the like ultimate, you know, the most like um, standard meme was, I was just called caps because um, the, the, the font or not the font, but the text was in all caps. Um, so, and it was just the, it was like, I'll maybe I'll share like an example in the chat at some point, but basically it was just, you know, whatever picture. And then it would always be this like red, um, red banner on the bottom with like white writing. So it was a kind of, yeah, it was a typology of, of like a caps lock meme. Then you, you started seeing these things, which, um, uh, started happening I think with uh, the increase of we're talking about vernacular creativity so I think people uh, started developing some sort of you know like these like digital skills that make you able to make memes so like being able to use like simple photo editing apps or knowing where to source materials uh, source images and also I think being like terminally online so if you want to make good memes you have to be constantly consuming memes I think when that happened, um, there was another era in Turkish memes, which are they were called montes. So basically, these like um, you could call them like uh, moving collages or uh, like like the idea of like photoshopping two things together. It become it like was called monte. And then interestingly, my final point is um, I remember um, a now defunct uh, website called Bobilar. Dot org this was the kind of place i think uh, where a lot of meme making was happening in in turkish and um it was a specific kind of meme making so much so that those memes on bobilar.com were called bobbies so um this is also i thought was like an interesting little like contextual uh, tidbit um recently i think it was last year it became too expensive for them to um, keep bobilar.org running. So what they did was basically they had to shut the website down, but not before they um, sent out like this message to 
I think all of their fans or all of these people that used to use it saying, can you please archive all these like Bobbies? Um, otherwise we're gonna lose this like amazing, I think like thousands, I don't know, of uh, of of basically memes from like 2005 to 2015 or something. So there's also, I guess another point is that memes also disappear quite easily um, in this like age of like content monopolization. Yes, for sure. Yeah, I grew up really during like um, the Facebook era, I think, of memeing, which was like uh, just pages on Facebook would post like a, yeah, a certain collection of memes and they were always like thematic about a certain thing. And um, you would just follow as many meme pages as you could. Um, and then sometimes like uh, those of us were really brave who would venture out of Facebook. They would kind of like create their own albums of things that they had found like somewhere else on the internet um so that was how i first came into contact with memes and obviously also sites like i funny and that and i have a huge like um kind of um local story like i'm french but i've mostly been participating in the anglophone context for a very long time uh but french meme pages are called um merci de something and so merci is like a french slang which should be read backwards which is Suna, which means like uh, somebody that looks for treasure um, so I just thought it was interesting that those kind of meme pages uh, were labeling themselves as like, you know, they'd kind of gone off to find something and then like, curate it. So there was this aspect of curation there, uh, which now is totally like, well, almost completely lost um, because most people just like wait for the algorithm to bring some memes. So we're kind of living this like 21st century, like, you know, hunter gatherer dependence that's like algorithmically driven. Um, so that's the, yeah, that's kind of my, was my first introduction to memes. Yeah, I feel like um, mine, mine was a bit different. I think I like admittedly got into memes a lot later than I should, given that it's like one of my main research subjects now. Um, but yeah, I was very much, um, I think I started like blogging on online around like the age of eight or so. Um, mostly in kind of Anglophone speaking cultures, like I'm Turkish, but I grew up in England. So it's actually really great to hear about the kind of Turkish meme communities as well. Um, but I guess for me, my kind of main platform was Instagram and I kind of moved backwards and traced back a lot of um, the kind of origins of these kind of memetic tribes and memetic identities. Um, from that point onwards, I think for me, um, it was really interesting to observe how kind of, again, going back to 2016 and um, the Trump election, how these kind of memes became carriers for political potential or political resistance, um, how that then spawned like multiple, like probably infinite, you could argue, um, kind of memetic political tribes um, that were kind of being adopted by Gen Z. Um, but I also found it very interesting, I guess, first of all, how this then, in like 2020, for instance, when political potential was perhaps dwindling, um, became kind of a mainstream carrier for pop culture, um, especially since obviously everyone was online. Um, it really felt that that was the year that internet culture, I wouldn't say replaced pop culture, but yeah, became like the main platform for it to kind of reflect the kind of collective happenings um, socially of our era, but to also then observe how a lot of the memes that we associate today um, did have origins in places like 4chan and kind of political extremist um, kind of backgrounds, a lot of incel culture, um, most of it also being kind of propagated and like peddled by essentially like radicalized teenage, in most cases for 4chan kind of boys. Um, and so yeah, I've I've taken a very kind of temporally confusing route into the meme world, I suppose. No, that that makes sense. I mean, it's uh, I think everyone has a very personal history with these kind of things because you, especially, yeah, when you when you pick up new technologies, maybe even as a kid or a teenager or young adult, how you encounter things is very contingent on where you are, who your friends or follows or interests are, and can be extremely different. Um, I, I again took some notes because I thought there were some emerging themes that are really interesting to me. So what what uh, you all mentioned sort of is that um, there there are practices that emerge beyond creating memes uh, and sharing them. But there's also uh, there's efforts in preserving them and curating collections. Um, but this seems to have changed 
because of algorithmic media and, and new kinds of uh, circulation that are basically enabled by uh, machine learning systems and, and algorithms. So um, that's been one change, uh, something that we can perhaps say it's actually new about memes. Um, and uh, and the other is this uh, connection to activism and politics um, and more broadly uh, engaging with aspects of society that are not just the internet. So memes are not just about the internet or some funny things that you find online and share, but they, they can be vectors for, for politics, for even engagement with popular culture or, or discourse more broadly. And I think this is maybe also something relatively new because uh, I was thinking back to the examples I showed <clears throat> of uh, Kilroy was here or even the office memes. Those were often very stable uh, they needed to be stable for years because they were carved on walls or, or photocopied in offices. So uh, soldiers would would see it and would would learn how to do it and and carve it somewhere else the next time they were deployed or in an office. I can imagine that you know it's all the the, the same 20, 100, 500 people who who shared this kind of humor, photocopied humor. And from the from the examples I've seen, these were quite also quite stable, quite conservative, quite repetitive, um, almost like stereotyped humor about uh, a historical moment that's quite consistent. But what I see with memes is that, yes, there is much more and there is um, a lot at the same time. And, and what is new is this sort of, yes, you, you need to engage in preservation and curation to sort of save what speaks to you or what you need, what you might need in the future. And also, um, I think what is new is precisely this, the rhythm uh, or maybe the acceleration of these cycles of novelty. I forgot who of you mentioned this, but um, it, part, of it, part of it is that you need to make sense of things that are always new. And if you're not on top of things um, or if you arrive late, uh, you might uh, not understand <clears throat> that something even is a meme. Uh, sometimes I use a, a lot of Twitter and Instagram <clears throat> and now TikTok a bit more. And sometimes I see things and I'm, I don't even know that they're memes. And then I realize days after that everyone is sharing them and making uh, new versions of it. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, that that was, you know, that's that's a meme now. And maybe by that point, it's already old and people are complaining about there being too many versions of it. So that, that really struck me as something that might be, uh, you know, for which memes are new, it might actually be um, not so, uh, it might be kind of true, really. Uh, I was wondering if you had any, examples of things that you've uh, noticed in your research uh, even most recently that speak to these kind of topics i don't have an example per se but just like um jumping off what you were saying um i think yeah the, what is also interesting about memes is because they change so much the form of them changes and then we're seeing things that we're not aware of or memes. Um, but also like um I think the kind of temporal or the kind of like because it's so much reliant on like irony, just um time passing plus irony will create a new way of looking at memes. So like people will like we will circulate boomer memes um like exactly how they were like when they were posted or we'll circulate like really early memes like templatable memes um like nothing will have necessarily changed about them but just like the irony that will have added through like our lens of looking at them 10 years later and kind of like cringing at ourselves or being like it's so funny that we found this funny like i think just the nothing even needs to change about them but the context of the irony and time passing and like our culture evolving will also just make memes new and create that cycle of novelty as well like i don't have that many examples but i think like loads of uh, boomer memes or like minion memes for example circulating as a kind of funny thing um is an example of that um I think this is quite interesting. I mean, um, the idea of presence is really um, interesting to me when we talk about not memes as, you know, these like objects, but memes as um, like um, personal attachments or social attachments or things that we share in common. I feel like the what Lucy was saying, like cringing at ourselves like together or laughing at a group of, let's say like, a generate the generation before us together. I think memes are also 
um they've managed to i guess this is part of their you know folkloric mm, function or their folkloric nature um is this like idea that we have to you have to be present um wherever memes are happening in order to i think um develop attachments to them because you don't really develop i feel like when i was developing attachments to memes or particular jokes or particular communities it was because i was sharing that with other people and this like idea of like the communion that memes provide to people i know that i can say it does research about you know uh, they're mentioning mimetic tribes as well i think is quite interesting because the idea of like presence communion um laughter and also self-reflection you know memes as a almost like they have these like I think both personal but also communal kind of psychosocial <laughs> properties. Um, and you know, people are talking about how this is we live in an age where um self-discovery is really, really important. I think memes also provide a sort of like mirror, a reflection of not only us, but also the people we see ourselves in communion with. Um so yeah. Yeah, again, uh, just to go off the back of that, um, yeah, I completely agree with what everyone said so far and that, yeah, like I feel essentially for to take means back to kind of the original um, kind of meaning and it's, yeah, they do, they are social signifiers, they kind of signal like a certain social cachet um, as again, like a form of digital folklore, it's really kind of echoing the collective fears and anxieties and desires of like any given time and obviously how this then kind of applies to generations is, is kind of informed by any kind of generations like general, like on we, so like with like Gen Z, obviously one of the biggest hallmarks is nihilism that relates to the politics. Um, with Gen Alpha, I guess with Skibidi Toilet and like um, all the subway surfer stuff, like absurdity is a really uh, kind of big hallmark for that. But also as like a side note, I do just think it's because they are 10 years old. Um, but I think one kind of good like case study really for the way that it can kind of maybe signal a social cachet is seeing how memes are actually being like brought to the offline as well. So I think um, last year, the boom of like post-internet fashion um, where we would see like, and you still see it to some extent now, but I guess brands like Praying really come to mind or OG BFF, like very predominantly in like the kind of New York adjacent internet scenes, you'd get a lot of t-shirts with um, kind of meme kind of um, slogans, um, which seem to have kind of directly been uploaded onto the physical, like um, potentially. But yeah, I think it's, it's interesting to see how um, these kind of ideas are then made analog when they are also so kind of time sensitive at the same time. And I see, I, for me, I'm like, maybe that's why kind of post-internet fashion seems a bit kind of like passe now so quickly. It's like the expiry dates get faster and faster, the more kind of information is readily available to us. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, <clears throat> I think since we are uh, 20 minutes, uh, we still have 20 minutes. I wanted to just say that the Q&A is formally open. If anyone um, who's listening has questions, I got a couple of them in the in the Q&A. You can type them there uh, and I will uh, ask them to the panelists. Um, I got a couple of questions from Tassin, which I will uh, relay to you. Um, the first one is how to comprehend, how to think about the, the dualities or multiplicities of memes. Uh, especially as they relate to space. And the other is um, what um, what value do you think memes have um, that's, or are they just limited to, to showing, to exhibiting something, or uh, is there something deeper to them? Um, I think this is quite a broad couple of questions. Uh, for, for me, I'll just uh, answer to, to seeing um for me the kind of multiplicity and of of memes and how they change across space as Gonzalo just said even beyond digital media um they they are physical objects they become physical objects uh they can be just words or 
trends uh, that can be very abstract uh, or that can be very specific. Um, and I think how to comprehend them or how to study them, uh, of course, is quite different for, for for each one of us, I assume. But for me, it's always been about um, trying to understand them socially. So with people who share them or make them or have fun with them, have some kind of engagement with them. Um, so for me, that's always been how to, to make sense of this massive uh, proliferation of yeah, what's now called content. Um, and that's for, for the other question. I think uh, we probably already answered it throughout the, this panel. I don't. I think all of us would agree that they're not just surface. Um, they don't just have surface value. They're not just about you know visual, sharing something visual or showing something or displaying. They 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 can have quite deep engagements with, as we said, popular culture, or politics, or identity, or uh, local. Um, contexts. So uh, those, my, those were my thoughts. But I'll, I'll also, I'll leave these questions open if any of you has more thoughts. Um, you can probably also see them in the Q&A tab. Um, I actually, I think we can maybe wait for questions. And in the meantime, I have a lot of questions and I don't know if you have things you would like to ask each other. Um, I, maybe I'll start because I had something that I wanted to ask Gunseli specifically. Um, we mentioned that, um, well, there's a lot of debates in, in popular culture and journalism, uh, in news media about memes. Um, and I think Idil also said something about this, uh, about how the, the rhetoric of novelty, uh, is also something that's quite predictable and expected because if you need to make something interesting, right, you, you, you talk about the new aspects of it. Um, so I was curious about, from your point of view, since you write about memes, um, you do research, but you also write about memes in uh, in news media or, you know, magazines. Um, I was curious about how you see your the landscape around you um, and what have you noticed uh, when you write about memes, um, what kind of reactions you get and and how does the, how is the novelty made sense of in your field, if that makes sense? <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I actually think there are quite a lot of parallels with academia in that um, new media and academia are both kind of um, institutions. And so I think um, a lot of problems that maybe is echoed across academia is also kind of applicable in that um, like we are kind of tied to certain um, kind of financial um, pressures, post-capitalist pressures, um, the internet moves so fast and so kind of responding to that um, with said pressures in mind, with said like time restraints, um, but also kind of the pace at which like a kind of old institution moves is very different to how the internet moves. Um, but I would say, like, I guess because I do write predominantly for a youth culture magazine, um, the way that it's received um, by readers is overall very positive. It makes me happy to see that people are also engaging with the analysis side of it. Um, but yeah, I feel like there will, in any institution, there will always be those kind of push and pull um, pressures. I, I don't know what everyone else on the panel's experiences have been with this, but it would also be interesting to hear. Yeah, for me, I think, I don't know, I probably uh, don't know if Lucy and Idil share this, but for me, uh, my feeling is always that academia kind of lags between, you know, journalism uh, and and uh, popular media writing uh, by a couple of years. Um, not not in, in what we do research about, but because things are published uh, much later and it takes time and then, you know, it has much less dissemination. So it's, it's interesting for me to read, for example, articles you would write today and then I know that in a couple of years there will be an, uh, an academic article about it um uh, but that's all, how it's always been I think it's quite um, yeah so that's why we try to have these kind of events um uh, I don't know if it'll Lucy have uh, thoughts on this um I think <laughs> I think um what's in really interesting is I get to teach really young people so this first year I mean I start um um, the school like the university year just opened and I met my students uh, last week and 
it's really interesting because um they're also when I say that you know you can study memes and that you know you can write about it and we're going to read about it one of the units of like the, the introductory media studies course is on memes I think they're uh they're quite shocked and and interested and excited because um I think it's still new you know like I I really I enjoy and sometimes feel like burdened by the like super like everyday or mundane nature of memes they're so mundane and there's like they're everywhere that it becomes they become almost like invisible for like an analytical like uh per, from an analytical perspective is that they're so just they're like kind of like the almost like the trash of the internet and if you're studying something like that I think often people are um they find it frivolous number one um then they then they're like kind of surprised and, and interested about it but then you also have to kind of justify why you are why you'd like to you know talk about it or take them seriously and I think the most interesting part for me is like when I tell people, you know, I study this because imagine how many memes do you say see in like in in one day, even if you know you're an older person. I mean, my parents they're like sending good morning memes to each other on WhatsApp like all day long. So it's like such an invisible but like important part of our everyday life, and it's um it's funny that they're like they're still treated as like kind of like a novel or weird um, weird interest research area to have yeah just to add to that actually um yeah this is something I've been thinking about a lot and I don't know how much this actually relates to the original question but um because memes are so readily available um and we do take them for granted but at the same time, like in the last few years, especially, I think ever since big tech uh, jumped onto the kind of creator economy in 2021 and actually coined that term to begin with. But we are seeing, yeah, like adverts and brands adopting the language of memes. Um, at the same time, the Ukraine war was dubbed the first ever meme war, where we see like literal states using the language of memes to kind of try and sway public opinions. The CIA is using memes to try and recruit people. And so I almost feel like the initial kind of the resistance that came with kind of early memes um, or even memes a few years ago um, is kind of being replaced with this, like, because they are literally everywhere in every kind of language they've been adopted by the people that memes were used to resist to begin with, I guess you could say. Um, and so it's interesting how we then kind of respond to all of this in a way that isn't just kind of endless churning for the sake of endless churning. It's not just let's like use another Trump mugshot and put another kind of weird filter over it and laugh at it. It's like, what are we actually trying to say with these things? And I guess that's a question I've been asking myself a lot recently. Yeah, that's interesting. So there is sort of a tension between, yeah, they become extremely everyday mundane, but with this comes a sort of more critical attitude to what you're doing with them um, when you when you share them or create them. Um, there is a question in the from the audience uh, by Paul Sutherland. Um, they say, I think this is a question for Lucy, but also for everyone. How do you think memes contribute towards alleviating alienation for either the creators or the viewers, uh, if they do at all? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Paul. Um, yeah, I've written about uh, like alienation and memes, and uh, I mean the title of my PhD is memes and alienation and digital capitalism. Um, but I think like um, memes have this kind of ability to uh, embody things um, without really serving like the connective power that we need to overcome alienation. Um, like we um, were able to see it kind of like um, um, in the form of the meme, because some, the meme is something that we circulate so much to the point of kind of like um, impoverishing it. Um, so for this kind of like I use a uh, heat of concept of the poor image, um, and that's something that it all just broke up, just brought up that like because we circulate memes so much, and because they are almost like the spam of the internet, they kind of fall out of our like horizon of interpretation. So we don't really pay attention to them as things that can like um embody feelings, embody different forms of knowledge. 
But I think uh, when we look at memes that have been over circulated and uh, memes that have like um, obviously um, been deteriorated by how much we use them, abuse them, edit them, remix them, uh, we kind of see the signs of them uh, becoming circulated and having all of these voices trying to intervene in them over time. So because there's so many voices speaking in the meme at the same time, I think they, they are a testament to like all of these people trying to articulate something they can't really articulate with words, but they um, that is being put um, into the kind of very form of the meme by over circulating it. Um, so I think these kind of memes that um, show a lot of editing, show a lot of remixing, show a lot of remediation, um, show us that um, we are part of this whole like global system of like circulation. Um, and that's almost why I don't really study memes in a super local context, because I study them more as like um, a very symbol of like the logic of circulationism. Um, and so as we all circulate a meme, as we pass it from person to person, I think there is like undeniably like intervention being made. Um, and so the things that we end up seeing is the result of um, a the meme uh, becoming alienated from the person that produced it. Um, so I think the meme becomes this like product and this very thing that confronts um, its initial producer as alien, as Marx would have written about alienation. And I think at the same time, the kind of aesthetics that come out of this process, these very like granulated, pixelated, like um, poor aesthetics, um, they've come to like be their very own like form of aesthetic shorthand for feelings of alienation. Um, so you see kind of memes where like um, deteriorated aesthetics and like um, glitch and like um, kind of TV static effects um, are used um, in like um, substituting words. So um, memes will say like, um, oh, um, I've set up for too long syndrome or something, and then replace um, the words with the TV static kind of image, and then it's like TV static syndrome. And so this is the very kind of like next step of like the kind of aesthetic that memes have created over time becomes this aesthetic shorthand that's created and that's put into a new meme. And this kind of like is like aesthetic engine of like creativity is also part of what's making like and driving memes to be new is also the very form of meme making is driving memes to kind of um, endlessly recreate themselves, endlessly produce new aesthetics and meanings. And over time, those uh, those kind of meanings that will have been associated to aesthetics will become embedded in the very things that we uh, circulate from now on. So I think the whole history of memes is like kind of always building on the past and what we're getting so much more complex than like the templates and the things that we grew up with um, because it's building on this whole like yeah, 10, 15 years of like circulating now. Well, thanks. That was great. Um, unfortunately, I mean, there are no more questions from the audience. So that's, uh, we wrap that up. But unfortunately I have to uh, also wrap our panel up because uh, we'll have the last five minutes dedicated to uh, closing remarks by the organizers. So, uh, wow, this was a really uh, great session. I'm really thankful to the three of you. Um, I took so many notes uh, and uh, was all I wanted to discuss today. So that was uh, really great. Thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this and thanks to the audience for uh, joining us and uh, listening to us talk about memes, which are our favorite things. And uh, I'll uh, I'll leave it to uh, Professor Crystal Abedin for the final remarks on the event. Thank you, Gabriel and your crew. I am really grateful to all our experts for volunteering your time. And for those of us who don't really have a concept of time because we live on a global universe, our European colleagues have just woken up and joined us in the last few sessions, whereas our colleagues in the Asia Pacific region are just about winding down for the day. So I do thank everyone for making this event as a co-host, as a panelist, and as an attendee, despite the time zone differences. Well, I have just a last few minutes to, again, reiterate thanks for the people who have made this event possible. I'd like to really acknowledge and thank my co-hosts, um, Professor Kath Albury, Dr. Natalie Hendry, and Dr. Gabriel Setta for co-hosting and also curating this event. They were chiefly responsible for framing the different sessions, as well as bringing on board the experts from whom we've heard. We want to say thanks to the Faculty of Humanities at Curtin for funding this event, as well as the ARC Council, sorry, ARC Decker Grant for
for funding this event and some of the research that has gone into today's um, presentation. Emeritus Professor Simon Torres, thank you again for opening us and giving us a welcome to country. And last but not least, our IER lab backend crew, Alex Fruit, our RA, who has been tirelessly live tweeting, Kristen Halkett, our RA in charge of publicity, River Juno, who was in charge of the visuals that you see today, Naomi Robinson, who is our Zoom extraordinaire, HDR student, as well as RA with the lab, and finally, research fellow Dr. Jin Lee, who is supporting us in the back end with all sorts of logistics. For our final slide, I'm really excited to give us a teaser of what's next. As with all the events that we run, recordings of this will be archived and available on ierlab.com. But we've also managed to secure a special issue with the International Journal of Communication. So you can look forward to today's discussions framed in an introduction and four peer-reviewed editorials covering Groundhog Day across our various topics. Coming up next for the rest of the year, we've got three reports being launched by the IER Lab. First off, the long-awaited benchmarking of influencer governance in the APEC region, and then towards the end of the year, platform created discourse, our one-year study focused on both the English and the Chinese markets. We do hope that you join us in future events. If you'd like to get updates, find us on the website or on Twitter, and we'd love to get in touch. Thank you, everybody. Have a very lovely morning, afternoon, evening, and I hope you get some good rest. That's all from us. Bye.